So let's think back to when we came up with our equation for the amount of work done by the spring force. What we had to do was uh, we realized that we could not use our equation for work that said force times distance because that was only applicable when the force was constant. With the spring force, here's the graph of the spring force as the amount of force as it varies over distance. Of course, that's F equals minus KX. That's what the graph looks like. If we took some amount of displacement by the spring, the force varies. So we can't say F times D. But if we chop up that uh, displacement into lots of little tiny sections, then the amount the force changes within that section is so small, especially if we choose a very small interval, that we can approximate it to be force times distance. And so we can calculate how much work is done for that interval and then do it separately for all the intervals and then add them all up to get the total amount of work. Okay? So that's, and, and the equation that showed that was called the Riemann sum with the sigma notation. But the definition of that is the definite integral. And this is the definite integral which says uh, these are our limits of integration from the initial position to the final position. And the sum, that's what the integral stands signs for, a big S for sum, the sum of all these little areas, which you, you think the interval times the force, that's base times height of that rectangle, that's the area of that rectangle. So the sum of all those areas is the amount of work done by the spring force from this position to that position. Okay, and that's uh, what it looked like, and we did the integration, and that's the equation that we got. Let's double check to see that this method works for other forces as well, not just the spring force. So let's go back to the very first one, the constant force, right? The constant force is just a straight line, horizontal line, because it's constant as we go over some uh, interval of position. And let's apply the same method, right? Let's take the sum of all the areas of these rectangles, force times distance. But if it's a constant force, this number is a constant, so it comes outside the integration, and all we have to integrate is dx, which is x. And from our limits of integration of x initial to x final, we plug in x final, and then we subtract what we get when we plug in x initial, and that's x final minus x initial, very simple. And we recognize that as displacement, and sure enough, the work is the force times the displacement. Let's try a general, any, any force, not a spring force, not a constant force, any general variable force. So what's its shape? I don't care. It's something that's not constant. So it's just some curve. But again, I take very small intervals. Within those small intervals, we can assume the force to be fairly constant. And so the, the force times the displacement is the area of that rectangle. So that's the amount of work done over that small interval and we add up all those works to get the net work. So in general, we can say the work done by a force is the area under the curve. If, now here's the, the especially important part, if we graph the force as a function of displacement or position, not time. You gotta be careful. Sometimes you'll see force versus time graphs. Sometimes you'll see force versus position graphs. The work is the area under the force versus position. And when we integrate and we plug in our limits of integration, we integrate, we plug in x final, and then we subtract from that what we get when we plug in x initial. And if you think about what that is doing, when I plug in x final, I'm getting the area under the curve from zero to x final. That's what that is telling me. Then when I plug in x initial, I'm getting the area under the curve from zero to x initial. And so the area between those two points is this area minus this area, which leaves me with this area, and that's the answer. And if I switch my limits of integration, right, if I'm going this way in my displacement, that's a positive displacement, and my force is positive. You see it's above the x-axis, so it's positive. That's positive work, displacement and force in the same direction. So if I go this way, I have positive work. And if I go this way, 
Now my displacement is in the negative direction, my force is in the positive direction. I have negative work being done. Okay? So uh, this area minus this area gives me a positive number. But if I do switch my limits of integration, then I've got this area minus this area, which still gives me the same magnitude, but now negative. Okay? So uh, the, the sign can be positive or negative for the work, depending on which way I'm displacing. So if I know an equation that describes this force, if I have some equation in terms of position that describes the force, I can integrate that equation and plug in my limits of integration and get a numerical value for the work done from x initial to x final. Or if I don't know the equation, but I can still get the area under the graph, I can just do it that way. So here's some, I don't know what the equation of that shape of graph is, but I can very easily calculate the area under the curve, can I? So from zero to one meter, I'm, I have a positive displacement and the magnitude of my force is some positive number. So I'm gonna have positive work done here and the amount of work is the area under the curve, which for a triangle we know is one half base times height. Here, I'm still moving in the positive direction, but my force now is a negative number, so this area is negative work. And you can see those areas are the same. So this positive work and this negative work cancel each other out, and all I'm left with then is to find what is the area in region A3, and that will be the net work done by this force over the displacement of zero to five. So all I'm saying here is the area under the curve of this force as a function of displacement is my work, and so that's A1 plus A2 plus A3, where A1 is a positive area, and A2 and A3 are negative areas, and the sum of all those adds up to negative 12 joules. And so that's the amount of work done by the force over that interval, interval of zero to five meters. All I had to do was take the area under the curve, and if you're moving in the positive direction, it will be true that if it's above the x-axis, it's positive work, and if it's below the x-axis, it's negative work, as long as you're moving in this direction, okay? All right, and the last section of chapter seven, we've been doing all this talk about work, how much work you do is one thing, but how fast you can do it is another thing. So uh, let's say I get in my car and I go, I tell you, hey, come ride in my car, man. It goes zero to 60 miles an hour. Awesome. <laughs> well, yeah, my Volkswagen bus goes zero to 60 in 27 seconds, right? My Porsche, goes zero to 60 in 3.2 seconds, right? Much more powerful, we say. So how much work you do is one thing, but how fast you can do it is the power, okay? So the rate at which work is done then is power. And if I take the amount of work I did and I divide it by the amount of time it took, that would give me the average power. Just like if I say I go so far in, in so much time, divide the distance by, by the time and I get my average speed. Similar idea here, the total amount of work divided by the time is the average power. If I want to know what is my power at some instant, at the instantaneous power, then just like with position and velocity, you take the derivative of it, okay? So if I have a, a function of work in terms of time now, remember, before we were talking about force as a function of displacement. Now we're talking about work as a function of time, okay? If I take the time derivative, then, and plug in, let's say I wanna know what's the instantaneous power at time equals three seconds, for example. I would take the derivative of the equation of work as a function of time, plug in three for t, and then I would come up with an answer for my instantaneous power at three seconds. And we know that work using the dot product of force and displacement is force times dx, that's the displacement, times the cosine of the angle between them, so that's the work and the time, 
I can group dx and dt together and recognize dx dt as velocity. And now I see that power is the dot product of force and velocity, right? Force times the velocity times the cosine of the angle between them. And so power is force, uh, the dot product, excuse me, of force and velocity, okay? And in your book, it gives the example of a truck pulling a, a shed across the ice, right? I guess this is up in Minnesota, probably, where they like to go ice fishing. So what do they do? They hook up their shed to the back of their truck. They drive out onto the frozen lake. They take an auger and they drill a hole in the ice. And then they pull the shed over the top of the hole and they sit inside the shed where it's nice and warm. Well, compared to outside the shed, I guess it's warm. Uh, not as cold. And they fish and eat sandwiches. And as the truck is pulling the shed across the lake, it's pulling it with some force and it's moving at some velocity. So that means the truck is doing work. It is transferring energy from the engine of the truck to the shed. But if the shed is moving across the lake at constant velocity, its kinetic energy isn't increasing. So this energy that's being transferred to the shed, if the shed isn't speeding up, where's the energy going? Remember, energy is always conserved doesn't just disappear. The truck is doing work, transferring energy to the shed. This is how much it's transferring at this rate. Where's the energy going? Hmm. How about if we think about it before we learned about work? Let's think back to chapters two, three, and four. The, the shed is moving across the lake at constant velocity. What does that tell me about the net force acting on the shed? It's zero, right? So if the truck is pulling it with the force this way, there must be some other force in the other direction that's, canc that's adding, causing the sum of the forces to be zero. What is that other force? Friction, right? As the, as the shed slides across the ice, there's friction. The truck is transferring energy to the shed at this rate, but the frictional force is the same amount in the other direction. I know that because the shed is moving at constant velocity. So the, the whole time the truck is trans transferring energy via positive work, friction is taking the energy away via negative work. And so the energy of the truck, yes, it's moving the shed across the lake, but there is no change in kinetic energy of the shed and all the energy is transferred to heat. If you think about the energy went here, then it went there, then it went there. If you just keep asking yourself, where did the energy go? Eventually, it's gonna end up as heat. And if you keep thinking, where did it come from, right? The truck is pulling the shed. Where did the, that energy, where was it? Gasoline. Stored in the gasoline, right? And how did it get there? Millions of years of plants decomposing and, right? Oil forming under the surface of the earth. And all those plants, where did the energy come from there? When they grew, the sun provided the energy, right? So most of the time, if you think, where did the energy come from? Back up, back up, back up, the sun. Now I guess you could say some energy comes from radioactive processes inside the core of the earth, fine. Most of it comes from the sun, and then if you keep asking yourself, where did it go, where did it go, where did it go, where did it go? It ends up as heat.